You are listening to a podcast from Essendon Presbyterian Church in Melbourne, recorded 10 a.m. on March 31, 2024, presented by Rev. Chris Duke. Um, so we're going to continue in the Corinthians and we're going to read from 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 12 to 20. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we, we come before your word now and we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, would enlighten us further to this wonderful fact that indeed Jesus has risen. And because he has risen, we too, those of us who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, also receive the hope of eternal of eternal life. We have the hope of the resurrection. And so, Lord, speak to our hearts today, this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, people are often tempted to doubt the truth of the Bible. Certainly, this is in the constant aim of Satan. He tries to bring doubts about the fundamental doctrines of our faith. And Satan has been trying to get people to doubt God and his word ever since creation. Of course, he deceived Eve by saying, did God really say this? (coughs) Satan will attack any and every doctrine, but he will especially try to attack the credibility and the truthfulness of God. He'll try to bring doubts and questions about the Bible and about God into your minds. And one doctrine that he loves to attack is the doctrine and belief of Christ's resurrection. Immediately after Christ's resurrection, Satan managed to cause people to doubt by having people say that the body of Christ was stolen. And Satan has not stopped trying to bring doubts about the resurrection. Even today he's trying to shake the most significant and pivotal foundation of our faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And since the dawn of Christianity, many people have endeavoured to discredit the resurrection story. For 2,000 years, sceptic after sceptic has sought to disprove the resurrection. And they have reasoned correctly that if they can destroy the resurrection, Christianity will prove to be false. Story is told that a believer inquired from another knowledgeable person about what he should do concerning a sermon that he heard, that he just heard his minister preach on Easter Sunday. And in that sermon, the minister had stated that Jesus had just fainted on the cross and his disciples had just nursed him back to health and the believer asked the person what do you think and the knowledgeable person answered by suggesting that perhaps this minister should be whipped 39 times with a heavy whip and of course that whip had metal tips attached to the end of each cord and then nailed to a cross and allowed to hang on that that cross in the middle of the eastern sun 
for approximately six hours and then to have a spear run through his side and then be embalmed and placed in an airless tomb for 36 hours. Let's see what happens. Now, please don't go out and try that. But I hope you get the idea of what Jesus endured, that the only possible conclusion was that Jesus had indeed died. There is external evidence to this historical fact that Jesus was crucified, recorded in documents, separate, from, of course, from New Testament scriptures. And when we turn to our reading here in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul was having problems with some of these early Corinthian believers. And if we were to examine all the earlier chapters of this letter, you would discover that Paul uh, encountered a number of issues within this new church. And then we come to this chapter, chapter 15, and it's the issue concerning the resurrection of the body, and it's discussed here. And that's why Paul commences chapter 15 with verses 3 to 4 by clearly stating his belief in the resurrection of Jesus as a statement of fact that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. In verse 5, he reminds them that Christ first appeared to Cephas, which is another name for Peter, and then to the other apostles. Then in verse 6, he appeared to 500 believers at one time. And most of these eyewitnesses were still alive when 1 Corinthians <laughs> was written. And then he appeared to James and then others. And, he, and then later he appeared to Paul on the Damascus Road. Paul saw the risen Christ. And Paul goes to great lengths to remind these early Corinthian believers that the resurrection was not some fanciful story that was only told by a few. But in fact there were many, many eyewitnesses who saw the resurrected Lord. And this is what these early Corinthians had first believed when they had first come to faith. They believed in Jesus' atoning sacrifice when he died on the cross and they believed in the resurrection. And now a few years later, after they first believed, Paul discovers that some of these believers are denying the resurrection of the body. And Paul turns his argument to the negative from verses 12 to 19, to show that their ideas were false. Because if Jesus didn't rise from death, then believers have no hope of rising as well. We have no hope of, of rising as well. In verse 12, Paul begins his argument that, that he has been uh, proclaiming, that Jesus has indeed risen and, it, and his resurrection has been witnessed and proclaimed by credible people. In light of the fact that they believe this, the question he asks in verse 12 is central. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? The problem was that some believers were denying that they were going to be resurrected like Jesus as well. And Paul's logic is very clear in this verse. If Christ has been raised, then our resurrection is obviously possible. I would actually say obviously certain. And then in verses 13 to 19, Paul demonstrates that the resurrection is not only possible, but it's essential to our faith. In these verses, Paul raises the consequences of believing that there is no resurrection of the dead. And he gives us six disastrous consequences if there's no resurrection of the dead. The first consequence has to do with Jesus himself. And Paul makes this point twice, first in verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. There is a significant contradiction in the Corinthians' logic, which Paul began addressing in the uh, first 11 verses. Now Paul is saying, in essence, for the sake of the argument, 
let's allow that there is no resurrection of the dead, then logically no one has or ever will rise from the dead, which means that not even Christ has been raised because he's a human being like you and me, albeit that he's divine. And this concept is also repeated in verse 16. For if the dead did not rise, then Christ is not risen. And Paul is painting an oblique, horrifying picture that he wants these Corinthians to see. And in verses 14 to 15, Paul summarises three disastrous theological consequences if Christ's resurrection has not taken place. First of all, without the resurrection, all Christian preaching and teaching and the other communication is in vain. It means that such preaching is empty. It means it's, em it's meaningless. It means it's a waste of time. But the depth and resurrection of Jesus on our behalf is the very heart of the, of the Christian gospel that we preach. For Paul reminds us that the gospel is defined by four phrases that are found in verses 3 to 8. And those four phrases, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to many people. But apart from the resurrection, Jesus could not have conquered sin and death and hell. And we would still be under our own sin. And therefore the consequences of our sin, which is death, and the judgment to come in hell, and it would have a very tight grip on us. And the good news would really have been bad news. And everything that Paul taught would have been just like smoke and mirrors. Every effort to evangelise and share the gospel would be a colossal waste of time if in fact the resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't true. With everything that makes the gospel the good news means that it's not good news. Strike the resurrection out and what do you have left? Perhaps some beautiful pieces of moral teaching a wonderful life marred by tremendous mistakes about himself, of his own importance and his relationship to men and to God. The fact is there's nothing left that is worth calling the gospel if there's no resurrection. And the second consequence is at the end of verse 14. Your faith is in vain. It's useless. Without the resurrection, our life of faith in Christ would be a waste of time for faith is a response to the gospel message. If the gospel that we've staked our lives on is a sham, then so is the faith that is produced. There's no point going to church every Sunday. There's no point participating in the various ministries of the church if Christ has indeed not risen. And the third consequence is in verse 15, is that all apostolic witnesses to the resurrection is indeed a lie. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he, had, he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. If the resurrection isn't true, then the Bible is totally untrustworthy. And it also means that the apostles were the world's greatest liars, the greatest con men on the grandest of scales. Their claim to be from God would be false and their witness concerning God that he raised Christ would be false. To deny the resurrection is to call the biblical writers not just mistaken, but willfully mistaken. There's no possibility that you would call the resurrection a mistake, an innocent or naive mistake, if Christ indeed had not been raised from the dead. If then the apostles were not sent by God to proclaim a message from God, they were just liars who conspired together. But because the gospel records along with other New Testament documents, 
are amazingly consistent with one another, those witnesses would have had to work together in order to come up with stories that meshed so perfectly. And this would have required the greatest of collaboration to ensure that their story was the same and it remained consistent. And if they lied about the gospel, why should they be believed about anything else? Why should we embrace their moral teaching if they lied about what Jesus taught about the resurrection? So all New Testament truth stands or falls together and it depends on the truth of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The last three consequences if Jesus wasn't raised are very personal for us. And of course the, the focus now is directed on how we as believers in Jesus would be affected. Listen to what Paul says in verses 17 to 19. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. You are still in your sins. Without the resurrection, every person who has ever lived would be hopelessly lost in vain. Our faith in Christ will not have actually saved any of us. We would be wandering around in the dark, lost as we ever were. All our sins from the past would still be with us, wrapping us up in a horrible robe of unrighteousness. If Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then sin would have won the victory over Christ and sin would continue to be victorious over all of us. If Christ remained dead, then, we, then when we die, we would remain dead and forever damned because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Without the resurrection, then Jesus hasn't brought forgiveness of sins. He hasn't brought salvation. He hasn't brought reconciliation. He hasn't brought spiritual life either now or for eternity. But you must have the resurrection to explain the cross. And then you need the life and the death of God in the person of Jesus in the flesh who became the propitiation for our sins, who appeased God's own wrath and satisfied his justice. Without the resurrection, we have nothing to preach which is worth calling the gospel. If you believe that Jesus is to be our sacrifice by his death and our sanctification by his life, but has not risen, then all we have is a martyr's death without the forgiveness of sin. It's only when we recognise that his death on the cross is actually explained by his resurrection that we have an understanding that Jesus has indeed redeemed us and he's redeemed us with the cost of his blood in forgiving our sin. And secondly, if Christ was not raised, death would still be victorious over life. And that's the point of verse 18. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If the resurrection wasn't true, not only would we all face death without hope, but we live and are tortured with the thought that our Christian family members, our Christian family friends who have already passed away, that they are indeed lost forever. There would be no, never any hope of ever being reunited in eternity with our loved ones. All we are left with is hopelessness and a few wonderful memories of the life that has ever been lived. But in 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, it tells us that this isn't true. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So due to the resurrection, we have this wonderful, absolute hope that we will see all of our believing family members. And finally in verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we have all men the most pitiable. And Paul's point is this, 
If all we get out of uh, Christ is a little inspiration, living a good moral life for a few short years, if Jesus was only a good moral teacher, then we're a pretty sorry lot. We're no better than any other pagan philosophy or religion. Why waste so much time and energy and resources on a foolish dream? Why bother investing time in missions, in discipleship, in worship, in evangelism, in fellowship or in ministry in the name of Jesus? And logically we could indulge ourselves in all the pleasures of life, in a hedonistic lifestyle of excess. We might as well commit ourselves to lying and stealing and sexual immorality. If there is no resurrection, then why try to live a life of spiritual wholeness? It doesn't seem worth it or logical. Life itself is made utterly miserable and pitiful without the risen Christ. So you might as well do whatever you can to satisfy yourself. But friends, we are people of the resurrection. Do you believe that? Amen? We are people of the resurrection. Today we live in a world in which the majority of people are actually clueless about the resurrection life of Christ, which is available to all. The majority of people know nothing of the salvation or blessing of resurrection life and what it brings. Everybody who doesn't know the, re the reality of the risen Lord has to live every day of their life without any surety of what is true and what is false. And they live with no saviour, with no gospel, with no forgiveness, with no meaningful faith, with no victory over death, with no eternal life and no hope for any of these things. That's why the people around us try so hard to anaesthetise themselves against the pain of an aching heart. And they seek such anaesthetics in the form of pleasure or maybe in materialism or alcohol or drugs or in recreation. However, when we come to verse 20, there's a big but that Paul emphasises. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And Paul uses but here to affirm the resurrection. It means that our preaching is not in vain. Our believing is not in vain. That we testify to the truth of God. That our sins are forgiven. That we live for eternity. That we are a blessed people. That the power of the resurrection is at work here and now in us. So the what if questions that Paul asks are answered. The foundation reality of our life and history, past, present and future, is focused on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our faith is grounded on it. As a Christian, I know that my Redeemer lives and he lives to grant me eternal life and that starts here and it starts now and it starts today. He is now my life. He is my all in all, my peace and joy, my saviour, my redeemer, my Lord. The glorious fact that Jesus rose again from the dead answers all self-doubt. It answers all recrimination. It answers all guilt and shame and it answers all condemnation. We all have unfulfilled desires. We all have unfilled dreams and hopes and we may even wonder whether they will ever get completed. But all of these, whatever your dreams are, they pale into insignificance compared to the promise of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ through his glorious resurrection when we are forever with the Lord. God understands the limitations. He understands your disappointments, all the areas of your lives that are not fulfilling. But friends, here under the gospel you're promised a resurrection body with complete and total fulfilment.
And this resurrection body that we're promised will never die. It will never know decay. It will never know pain or suffering or sin. It's the same resurrection body that Jesus has. And our proclamation today, just as it was for Paul and the other apostles, is that Jesus lives. Amen? The Christian faith is all or it's nothing. If Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, our faith is nothing. If Jesus has been raised from the dead, our faith is the only thing. If the resurrection is true, it has verified everything that Jesus said. And Jesus said, of course, of himself, he is the way to life. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in Acts 4.12, the Apostle Paul reminds us that there is no, that there, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. But I want to ask you personally, friends, are you able to say that for yourself, that Christ is risen? Are you able to ask that of yourself today and believe that Christ is risen? Do you believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that his resurrection was for you personally? If you don't, then can I encourage you that you can have assurance, you can know for certain because Jesus did die. He died for you personally and he rose again for you personally and today Jesus is asking you to believe his word and to take it by faith to turn to him to change your mind that's what repentance is about him to repent and to receive the joy of the resurrection the joy of your salvation if Jesus did not rise from death, then believers have no hope of rising as well. But Jesus did rise from death. Therefore, believers will receive the resurrection with the blessed hope of eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that none would leave today without that assurance that Jesus has indeed risen and that he lives And, Lord, that he has risen for each one of us personally so that through faith in his death and resurrection, we too will also receive the resurrection of eternal life. Lord, we pray that not only we but many would know about the resurrection this day and every day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. More messages of hope at Essendon Presbyterian Church.org.au or wherever you get your podcasts from.